Okay, Mark, let's get started. All right, great. Good afternoon and welcome everyone uh, to this uh, webinar, Safeguarding Civil Rights, North Carolina's Road Forward for At-Risk Communities Amidst the COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, I'm Mark Dorison. I'll be the moderator for today's uh, program, which is presented by the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. As many of you know, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law was created at the request of President Kennedy in order to move the struggle for the protection of civil rights from the streets into the courts. The mission of the Lawyers Committee is equal justice for all through the rule of law, targeting in particular the inequities confronting African Americans and other racial and ethnic minorities. You might also know that um, Elizabeth and I became part of the organization last July when the Julius Chambers Center for Civil Rights merged with the Lawyers Committee and we became the regional office here in North Carolina. That decision was motivated in part by the recognition that our state had become the epicenter for many of the most critical civil rights issues and the most critical civil rights advocacy happening in the country. We're very fortunate today to have an incredible panel of dedicated social advocates, all of whom have been working for justice and equality for people of color and low wealth residents facing the disparate impacts of structural racism. These impacts um, have only been worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic, exposing the foundational defects in our society and the disparate um, impacts with regard to access to healthcare, food, housing, and economic and educational opportunities. And, and the folks who are joining me today have been uh, working diligently in the struggle to address those impacts. These inequities, unseen and unacknowledged for too long, of course, have been once again exposed to the world by the most recent racialized police brutalizations and the outpouring of grief, anger, and resistance in response. There is much to discuss today and there is great work to be done. I'm gonna introduce the panelists as they speak in turn and just wanna let everyone know that if you have questions as, as we go through the program, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we'll keep track of those and we will um, turn and answer those following the presentations, the short presentations from each panelist. Uh, also, this session is being recorded and will be able to be made available uh, after we finish. Again, thank you for being here today. Our first presenter is Serena Sebring. She's the executive director of Blueprint, a statewide coalition of nonprofit organizations working to ensure that all North Carolinians have a voice in our democracy and a full share of its benefits. Serena. Thanks so much, Mark. Uh, and greetings, good afternoon, Team Justice. I'm glad you're out there. My name is Serena Sebring. I use she and her pronouns. Uh, as was mentioned, I am the executive director of Blueprint North Carolina. I'm also the mother of three black children uh, and an organizer. And so this is a moment. Um, about Blueprint, um, for those who are not familiar with our work, wanted to offer just a little overview. We're a partnership of 54 uh, movement building uh, C3 organizations and a web of allies committed to building independent power for an anti-racist inclusive democracy. We believe that inclusive democracy requires open, reflective and responsive governing institutions. We know that structural racism and economic inequalities shrink and weaken dem democratic processes through laws, through practices, through culture that have for too long excluded many, black people, people of color, poor and working class people, women, LGBTQ people, people with disabilities from access and representation. And therefore we sustain and grow an expanding progressive infrastructure capable of shifting policy hearts and minds. We know that we cannot have an inclusive democracy without clean air and water. We know that we cannot have an inclusive democracy without affordable housing, equitable public education, justice in policing, healthcare, um, and healthcare because these are all necessary preconditions of full participation in a democracy that can actually work for all of us. We are an invitation to movement and a scaffold for the builders of a North Carolina in right relationship with its people. 
it's my honor to speak on behalf of Blueprint. Um, and in all of our uh, in all of our interests, I'd like to begin with just an acknowledgement of the collective grief and heartbreak um, that we all bring to these little boxes this afternoon. For some of us, we are all too present to a grief that just can't be held alone. Uh, and so across these networks and across these boxes, we hold it together. We know that we hold disappointment, sorrow, sadness, uh, wishes for the world that we long for, uh, and, and heartbreak for every Black child who is taught to get smaller and to have less freedom in preparation for a world in which this is the cost of survival for some. Our hearts are broken for all the people whose lives have been lost to the hands of those sworn to keep us safe, for all whose names that we know and those whose names we never will, for George Floyd, for Akiel Denkins, for Breonna Taylor and Tony McDade, for Ahmad Arbery, for Keith Lamont Scott, for Jonathan Farrell, for so many more for too many names, for too many years. This is the moment we meet today. Yesterday, I was on a different call, planning and trying to connect to Zoom, getting ready to speak with you all this afternoon. Uh, and it became clear to all of us that a shift was needed in order to acknowledge not just the impact of COVID-19 on our civil rights and on our lives, um, which was enough to talk about, trust me, to begin with, um, but now also to include this moment that is unmistakably historic and painful that we find ourselves in. I expected to tell you about all of the innovative and strategic ways that our direct service and civic engagement partners are meeting a public health crisis with people first work to expand the electorate and the political horizons for all the people of North Carolina. And yesterday, we felt clear uh, that in acknowledgement of this moment, we needed to talk about what it means to be a progressive movement in the midst of unrest. In the whirlwinds of far too long overdue cultural and policy shifts against the grain of brutal history of racial genocide, oppression, and inequality, we find ourselves here. Committed to racial equity and collective impact, clearer now than ever that this is a tipping point and that this is actually all of our business. That Black lives are the business of every sector of progressive movement. And that what this moment demands is that we play our part to understand the intersections and those including but also beyond street level police murders in protecting civil rights and yes, the very lives of directly impacted people and communities. We lift those intersections on this call today, knowing that public policy, criminal justice, environmental justice, voting rights and education justice are inextricably linked in not just the living experiences of us all, uh, but that those who fight on this team justice face common enemies uh, and that this is the fabric of justice for which we are accountable to future generations to make whole. COVID-19 may be unable to distinguish between races and classes of its victims, and yet our society as its host is unmistakably shaped by brutal distinctions that mark some whole and others only partially worthy of full, of full citizenship. What is the antidote? We say the antidote is a multiracial, multi-class, multi-gendered, multi-issue movement that holds street protest as sacred as the ballot box in civic engagement. And that acknowledges policy shift as one tool, but not the only tool rightfully deployed in the service of the world and the North Carolina that we know all people deserve. Today, we sit poised to uh, receive the release of policy recommendations from, emerging, from an emerging black brown policy network in the form of statewide demands in response to the murder of George Floyd as a catalyzing moment. We will share those with you as soon as they are, are shared with us. Um, our partners have been working very hard uh, to meet the moment with a clear set of demands, and we look forward to sharing those with you. 
we were already <laughs> working in a moment um, when it was evident that we needed to be about the business of people and about the business of care. Uh, and, and that care looks like people first approaches to outreach, looks like never ever sacrificing safety for the rights, because those are false distinctions. We cannot have our rights in full without safety to, uh, achieve, to attend schools, to receive the education that all children deserve. We know that we have to acknowledge that there's a double hit of, um, of impact on communities of color, that structural barriers and voting access already are amplified by COVID, which is already disproportionate um, and impacting Black Americans. We know that the pandemic is also further exposing existing marginalization of neighborhoods and rural communities, bearing the burden of land uses that contaminate air and water. And we know that special needs students are so much more impacted by a COVID-19 epidemic that has closed schools uh, and, and uh, lack the, the school provided breakfast and lunches, internet service, uh, as well as access to a host of services that are deeply important for full democracy. And so I am honored to be joined by my colleagues in what will be an intersectional discussion of what it looks like to actually safeguard civil rights for all the people of North Carolina. Thank you, Serena, that, uh, for that inspiring opening. Um, we're gonna turn now to um, Ginny Fogg, the Supervising Attorney at Disability Rights North Carolina, which is a legal advocacy agency that fights for the rights of people with disabilities, including cases involving discrimination, abuse, or other civil rights violations. Ginny? Thank you, Mark, and, and thank you very much, Serena. Um, so um, following on um, some of the points that um, Serena has has um, so eloquently uh, brought to us today. Um, I, I want to talk about um, the um, the effects of of COVID and um, the situation we are in now for um, students with disabilities and um, for students living in poverty and Black and Brown students, and um, particularly about students who live at the intersection of um, all of those categories. So um, we already know that um, students with disabilities and students living in poverty and black and brown students um, uh, have it face disparities in education and educational outcomes um, every day and um, that there are additional disparities that are created by COVID that amplify the already existing disparities and also add to the list of disparities. So even before COVID, um, students um, were um, lacking access to quality instruction, well-trained teachers, availability of support staff, including such key support staff as um, teaching assistants, counselors, nurses, school psychologists. Um, and they're also lacking instruction to be delivered in a way that they could receive it and that would allow them to make reasonable progress. Um, and in addition now, th those same um, issues abound, but we also have additional issues of um, lack of food. Um, there's, you know, so many students are now going without school provided breakfasts and lunches and sometimes also snacks and um, after school programs that also provided some of that nourishment. Um, internet service and um, tablets and computers, even if internet service exists. Um, and then also some particular extra challenges for appropriate teaching methods. So for example, um, you know, some, some students um, already were perhaps receiving um, pullouts and um, for instruction that allowed them to be in a smaller setting, perhaps with a special education teacher. And um, now it's much more challenging um, for that to happen, even in a house that, ha that has internet and an appropriate device and um, an environment that allows the student to participate in that type of learning. 
because um, the fact that it's remote, it may need to e be even smaller uh, group and there may not be enough teachers to make that happen. Um, we didn't suddenly multiply our teaching force uh, when we moved to um, online instruction. So as a result, students are, are not receiving the instruction that they need and are falling further and further behind their non-disabled peers. Certainly we acknowledge that um, students without disabilities and students who are not um, uh, in experiencing disparities um, even before COVID are, are falling behind, but those students will have the supports and services and um, history of success that they need to quickly make up for lost time when they get back to school. But um, the students that uh, we're talking about today um, do, not, do not have those ingrained supports um, in their environment or in their school um, experiences. And so when they go back to school, whenever that is into the school building, it's going to be much more challenging for them to adjust to the new environment and the increased demands and output that they have not experienced for the past several months. Um, so um, in thinking about as parents and advocates and attorneys, what can be done to help remedy these issues, um, there's um, several options that I um, really encourage people to think about and take advantage of. First of all, just from um, a um, basic understanding of special education law and education law in general, um, students in North Carolina have the right to a sound basic education. And students with disabilities also have the right to an education that meets their unique needs. So federal and state guidance during COVID confirms that those rights have not changed. And the guidance does recognize that it may not be possible for schools to meet their legal obligations during this time. But the guidance absolutely does not let schools off the hook for that missed instruction. Instead, it says that when schools resume, students are entitled to compensatory education, which is a well-established um, remedy in uh, special education law and other areas of law. And, and special com compensatory education can look different for every child and it should look different for every child and meet um, their needs, but it's just extra instruction at a later date that makes up for what was missed during this time. Now, in order to uh, enforce those rights to, um, for the students, parents and advocates can choose to pursue formal or informal remedies. I wanna talk about the formal remedies first because um, I think we have a tendency to, um, to feel more comfortable as, as parents and advocates um, and even lawyers sometimes with the informal remedies. Um, because we don't want to make people uncomfortable um, and um, because we naturally um, have um, great respect for the teachers that have dedicated their lives to teaching our, our children every day um, and for the authority that exists within the school building, the multiple layers of authority that we were taught to, uh, to respect and abide by um, as very young children. Um, but um, in terms of remedies, um, there's some very effective formal remedies that exist, including filing a written complaint with the Department of Public Instruction. Um, and that, that would be if it's a child with an IEP with the Exceptional Children's Division. Um, those, um, it's a very easy form. It's, um, you do not need an attorney to do it. And it's a very easy process for parents and advocates. And um, I highly recommend that. And there are also informal remedies, including talking with um, the teacher and the principal and the exceptional children's director and with people on your local board of education and at the state board of education. I also think during this time, there's an increased need for clear communication and creative problem solving. And um, that means sometimes for that to happen, we need to partner with each other more um, so we can help each other out and support each other it, during those really uncomfortable conversations that naturally have an emotional um, tie for us. When you're, when you're, when you're advocating for, for your child uh, in particular, um, a lot of times you need somebody there to help steer you along and make sure you've made your points and, and help you with um, your naturally sometimes angry emotional response and help you figure out how to take the next steps. Um, and um, I also want, to make it clear that there are organizations out there that are, um, this is our job to help you during these times. Um, and that's disability rights, 
that is uh, Legal Aids Advocates for Children's Services, ECAC, the Autism Society, the Family Support Network, the ARC, and many others. And I encourage you, if you haven't during this time and your child is not getting their needs met, whatever those needs might be, to reach out to one or more of the organizations because we are here for you and we want to help you in these situations. Thank you. Thanks, Ginny. And um, uh, thanks for giving us some of that important context. It's great that, you know, I so appreciate Serena's broader framing and then hearing some of the specific challenges um, that communities are facing. I just want to remind folks to, uh, if they have questions, to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. We're going to be uh, taking and answering all your questions um, at the end of the presentations. And, and we've set aside, um, you know, about 15 or 20 minutes for that. So please uh, utilize that function for any questions you have. Uh, next up, we're going to turn to voting rights and Tomas Lopez. Tomas is the executive director of Democracy NC, an organization dedicated to protecting elections in our state and promoting citizen ownership of government. Tomas, welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, and I, I want to acknowledge, um, you know, my fellow, fellow panelists and as well the work of the Lawyers Committee. Um, you know, part of my role here at Democracy North Carolina, I was uh, a voting rights attorney at the Brennan Center and, you know, worked closely with the Lawyers Committee, it, it admired, uh, long, long admired the work of the organization and glad to have you here in North Carolina with us. Um, you know, our organization, Democracy North Carolina, works statewide to really kind of build, you know, eventually, right, a just and equitable state uh, where everybody's got a say in choosing their leaders and their outcomes. And, you know, we do that through subject matter research, through grassroots organizing, and through advocacy. You know, we are trying to improve both the structures of democracy, so voting rights, redistricting, money in politics, but also the culture of it you know, what it means to participate in democracy, to vote and to hit the streets and to call your lawmakers, all the different ways in which you end up affecting those outcomes. And, you know, not just now, but obviously, especially now, you know, it's worth identifying the fundamental connection between democratic structures, political participation and structural racism. You know, we're never going to have the democracy we want as long as people no, they live in a system that will kill them, whether swiftly through the use of force or more slowly through neglect or disparate treatment. And we also know that the story of voting and representation in this country is inextricably tied to race. Right? You can look at the way voting qualifications have worked since 1787, you can go back to the three-fifths clause and what that meant for representation, and you can go to the recent history, both here in North Carolina and around the country, you know, in particular since 2013 and the loss of the full protections of the Voting Rights Act to understand racial discrimination in the way in which our election laws have been written and applied, both in intent and in impact. And so when we talk about the potential impact of the current public health crisis on access to this year's election, we've got to acknowledge the possibility uh, and really kind of the creeping reality of a double hit on communities of color. The first being from the structural barriers to voting that already exist, but the second from COVID itself, which is already disproportionately sickening and killing Black Americans in greater numbers. That crisis in the really specific context of election administration creates several pressures on election systems, and North Carolina is a really good example of how this plays out. You know, the first pressure created by COVID is a resource challenge. You know, there, is, there are real economic costs to the public health crisis. That means fewer resources available to elections, especially in states like North Carolina, where a significant portion of the money spent on elections is generated at the local level. And so one important thing to know about election administration is that it is very decentralized. You know, we have 50 states, we have 50 different elections that are each administered by their own agencies. Here in North Carolina, we have 100 county boards of elections that play really important roles in that process, including in appropriations. And it looks like there's less money to go around. That's money for poll workers, for supplies, for keeping polling places open. Second thing I want to highlight is that social distancing and this overall situation is going to increase the demand for absentee by mail ballots. In North Carolina, we are in what's called a no excuse absentee by mail state. And what that means is that 
any person, any eligible voter can cast an absentee by mail ballot. But the problem here is that you need to jump through a lot of hoops in order to do so. And we're really interested in trying to lower those barriers. So here in North Carolina, you can get that absentee ballot, but there's a particular way, particular way to request it that has to be by postal mail or in person. And then once you fill it out, you've got to have either two witnesses or one notary be present when you're casting the ballot. Third thing is that we face real issues with in-person voting as well, which in our particular instance in North Carolina is by far the most popular way that people vote. And what we have is a largely elderly population of poll workers who do the critical job of keeping our polling places open. But they, that population, that poll worker population could be diminished by the COVID threat, uh, which unaddressed uh, would lead to large polling place closures and longer lines in those places that stay open. And a really good example of what that could look like is from Wisconsin this past spring, when on primary day there, um, you had the city of Milwaukee go from, I think about 180 polling places to five actually open on election day. And there were a lot of reasons why Wisconsin ended up in that spot. But one of the really, really critical ones is that there were not enough polling places, enough poll workers to keep all those polling places open. And the last, and, and maybe one that's less visible to folks, is that our stay home posture, the cancellation of events, our public resistance to return to pre COVID habits and behavior are curtailing the availability and reach of voter registration and other in person civic engagement efforts. We, you can look at a chart that exists of voter registrations from the beginning of the year to where they are now, and they fall off a cliff in mid March and they've only decreased since. The challenge we face is that a lot of voters, especially less likely voters um, who aren't already registered, they register through third party voter registration drives, groups that are canvassing at supermarkets and public demonstrations and knocking on doors. And that isn't really happening right now. And that's a challenge. And so you might ask, what can be done about it? In North Carolina, we are focused on trying to change our election rules in light of COVID. You know, we wanna make sure that it's easier to both get and cast an absentee ballot. We wanna make sure there are meaningful resources for elections, that our state is making appropriations necessary to get tens of millions of, millions of dollars in federal money that can go toward things like paying poll workers. Uh, we have also filed litigation. Uh, we are plaintiffs in a lawsuit that is basically saying, look, our election laws do not respond to the reality that exists on the ground. And because of that, they need to be, they need to be different. Uh, lastly, we are engaged in direct advocacy to state and local officials who even after all this legislation is resolved, litigation efforts are resolved, both of which are ongoing at the same time, will control key decisions in the process of voting access this fall. And so I would invite folks on the call who are interested in getting involved, particularly in that slice of the work in your own county in getting involved in the decisions of where voting happens, whether early voting is available on weekends, decisions over poll workers. You can visit our website, democracync.org. We have ways that which people can get involved. There is going to be a lot to do to make sure we have voting access this fall. COVID has only raised the stakes and recent events only remind us of the place of voting in this really larger and critical picture. So I'll throw it back to you, Mark. Thanks, Tomas. Uh, it's good to get some uh, uplifting uh, comments and, you know, in the midst of all this and how we can get engaged. And I, I mean, everyone's making those, but it's, it's a good reminder about the, the localized aspect of what we, um, uh, of how we can start to engage. Um, again, reminding folks to use the Q&A. We're going to answer those at, after the, the panel is finished. Um, and I appreciate seeing folks starting to take advantage of that um, and are, I'm interested in engaging in the dialogue. Uh, next up is Cami Chavis. Cami is a professor of law and the director of the criminal justice program at Wake Forest University School of Law. Cami, thank you for joining us. Hello, thank you for uh, having me. And I certainly want to thank the uh, Lawyers Committee uh, for Civil Rights for sponsoring this forum and for my colleagues for doing the work that, that they do, my fellow presenters for doing the work um, that they do. I'm so proud uh, to have uh, each of you and all the organizations working and advocating um, for the civil rights of those in North Carolina. 
Um, and I'm really grateful that Serena opened with the acknowledgement uh, of the moment that we are in and uh, the continued calls for police reform, police accountability, uh, and just in general reforms in our criminal justice uh, system. So uh, we've all heard the uh, old adage that, you know, when America catches a coal, it's bracket black black and brown folks that, that catch pneumonia. Um, and that couldn't be uh, even more true um, in the era of COVID. So what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today is uh, how uh, COVID-19 has exacerbated or highlighted, both highlighted and exacerbated um, disparities within the criminal justice system. Um, and those disparities uh, that have brought us to the moment uh, where we are. So, um, so let me say a little bit about just crime in general. Like, I, I, I wonder, like, what is happening in terms of just uh, general crime trends? And um, there tend to be fewer crimes being committed um, because um, of, of everyone is a lot of people, not everyone, and I'll talk about that, but a lot of people uh, are staying at home. But um, parts of the, the criminal justice system that are impacted and affected by COVID, um, there's no part of our criminal justice system that is untouched by this. Um, courthouses for a long time, um, you know, had, were, were closed for uh, the majority of, of business. Defense lawyers, uh, I'm sure those of, of you on the call, some of you have uh, experienced limited access to your incarcerated cl clients, and that's gonna have an impact, that could have an impact um, uh, on their uh, cases. Um, law enforcement agencies uh, limiting uh, contact uh, with police. And this, I think, I uh, will kind of end my comments with how I think that this actually could be um, a good thing. Um, and then there is, um, but we are also seeing uh, increased incidents of domestic violence. Um, and there are some uh, hopeful and novel things maybe that will come uh, out of uh, COVID-19, uh, some pilot programs for uh, digital jury trials, um, you know, imposing um, new social, um, uh, I think that uh, one of the problems uh, has been uh, you know, imposing these new social distancing orders orders and um, the ambiguity of how those orders are drafted and the unequal enforcement of those uh, orders. Um, and then I'm also going to talk about, um, some, of course, the outbreaks that we're seeing um, in, in prisons. Um, so um, one, uh, one thought, uh, you know, the Marshall uh, Project has uh, found, so it has some data out of uh, different uh, areas nationally, San Francisco, Detroit, uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, um, reporting less crime uh, week over week, week after week, uh, since the imposition of social distancing uh, rules and substantially less crime uh, when the dates were compared with a three uh, a three year average. Um, we've seen some uh, jurisdictions uh, have a reduction in uh, shootings uh, and gun violence um, that had previously been rising. So Chicago um, is uh, an uh, example um, uh, of that. Um, but what does all of this, uh, this mean for uh, civil rights? Even though crime, crime is down um, and arrests have declined, these arrests have not declined evenly across all demographics. And, and so if you look at different cities across the country, um, the rate of arrests for people of color, uh, while all the rates are declining, the arrests for people of color are declining slower than those uh, of whites. Uh, so uh, there are, again, of course, some economic explanations, um, again, that highlight uh, that uh, COVID-19 has highlighted, um, we know that um, many low-wage workers uh, are, uh, there's a disproportionate amount of um, Blacks and Latinos 
uh, who are low wage workers or now uh, now they are become essential uh, employees. And so um, in a lot of cities, these tend to be uh, folks of color. And because they're moving about more often, they have more interaction with law enforcement. Um, there's an interesting study um, a few weeks ago that says, you know, what we're asked to stay at home, well, only one in five Black people can actually do that. Only one in five Black people ha has a job that would allow them to do that. It's one in six for um, uh, Latino, Hispanic people. So um, what does this mean? This means that these we're, we're more exposed <laughs> in terms of our health, uh, health implications, um, but also uh, our uh, interactions with law enforcement. Another just quick thing that I would mention um, when we're thinking about uh, and, and particularly when we're thinking about the protests that are happening uh, right now and some of the, the crackdowns that you've, you've seen in areas across the country. Um, uh, but in my mind, I, I have images of some of the uh, militia and uh, groups that showed up with uh, you know, AR-15s in, in different places. Um, and those, uh, they have not been treated in the same manner that a lot of these uh, other protesters have. Um, and uh, there's also, uh, so there's a, a disparity in treatment there, real uh, interesting contrast to think about. There's also a substantial concern about the ability of people of color to uh, comply with the CDC uh, recommendations um, regarding uh, wearing face coverings uh, and then not being subject to racial profiling. So uh, where it is prudent to wear a mask when you go out, there are certain groups, and this has been articulated and found, that are not comfortable doing that because they think they're going to unfairly be targeted uh, by law enforcement. And there was actually in the News and Observer, uh, a student, a, gra a Duke graduate student, uh, said he had concerns about that. And I'm quoting here, he said, a black man in a mask is just seen differently than a white one. Um, and so uh, we also know that Governor Cooper's uh, guidance on face coverings does include a statement acknowledging that, that some populations may feel anxiety uh, over fear of being profiled. So here you are, you have this fear of being profiled and it's uh, impeding your ability to uh, protect yourself. So, so those, are, those are some issues we can think about, but uh, the last thing that I'll mention is um, related to um, incarcerated uh, persons. Um, just sitting ducks for, uh, for COVID-19. And this is, is still very much the case. Um, we think about the density um, in, um, in uh, jails and, and prisons. Uh, social distancing is a joke. It's impossible. And it's really challenging uh, to move people uh, around enough to appropriately clean and disinfect surfaces. And um, Again, and so, and then we have you know, guards that are, are coming in. So how, how did, um, how were jails and prisons uh, folks um, infected? Yes, it could be from uh, new residents of those areas, but it's also uh, guards uh, and corrections officers who are, are bringing it in and then, of course, bringing it back out to their families as well. So um, federal prisons um, have actually experienced uh, some of the worst uh, outbreaks, and if we want to tie things to North Carolina here. We know that uh, six people have died at uh, Butner uh, Federal Prison. Um, uh, North Carolina is in the top third of states uh, with incarcerated people uh, testing positive uh, for COVID. Um, and then uh, two of um, the juvenile centers uh, in North Carolina have also had uh, outbreaks and even though, and there haven't been uh, any deaths at the youth facilities, uh, but there have been uh, two uh, uh, folks who died uh, of COVID-related uh, complications at the Noose uh, Correctional uh, Facility uh, and a woman who died at the Women's Correction uh, Institute in Raleigh. So uh, people in prison uh, in North Carolina are 95% more likely to die than those in the general population. So um, even though, and, and we see that um, the North Carolina Department of Corrections uh, has only tested around 4% uh, 
of, uh, of the population and neither the Department of Public Safety or the governor's office had any plans to release uh, prisoners uh, in, in an effort to expose, uh, to reduce the exposure risk. There's also no data uh, on jail populations uh, because each of the county jails is run by an office of the sheriff and without this centralizing force, uh, it's a limited ability to collect data. So I, I think just uh, in closing, the last thing that I would say is that we're going to learn a lot. Some, some jurisdictions are pulling back from uh, to, you know, or trying to, try to minimize their uh, contacts with um, it, nationally. Uh, some jurisdictions are trying to minimize the contact that officers have and are kind of thinking uh, differently about how they're um, deploying their resources. And I think that we need to keep really good data uh, on that because it could tell us that maybe we didn't need to uh, have police officers uh, intervening in those cases anyway. Maybe those uh, situations didn't call for a criminal justice response uh, anyway. And, and this can be, it can help us to solve the very big problem that's still going to be here when COVID-19 is gone. And that's criminal, uh, that's disparities in the criminal justice system. So what can we do? Last thing, please donate to whatever bail funds you have in your, in your communities. There's one thing we can do. Thank you, Cami. Um, a lot to think about there, and a good a good example of um, you know the intersections between a lot of this stuff that's happening both on the ground and um, um, the response that we are seeing or not seeing um, from the government. And so, um, and information, as you mentioned at, there at the end, is one of the is one of the key elements that are missing. Um, the final panelist today is my. Uh, colleague here at the Lawyers Committee Regional Office, longtime uh, colleague and good friend Elizabeth Haddix. Elizabeth is uh, the other managing attorney here at the Regional Office and was uh, formerly the managing attorney at the Julius Chambers Center. Um, she works on a range of civil rights uh, matters, but primarily leads our environmental justice docket. And we'll talk to us about that. Elizabeth? Thanks. Um, such an honor to be with all of you. It's good to see comments from friends and um, really just an honor to be with these panelists as well. There's two things that Serena said that are still sort of reverberating in my head. One, you know, we face common enemies. And the other, we cannot have our rights without schools, clean air, safe places to live, access to the vote. Environmental justice, the definition of it is no group of people should bear the disproportionate impact or share of the negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial, governmental, and commercial operations of policies. Humans make trash, humans make pollution, and there should not be any group of people that bear the disproportionate burden of the results of that. Um, but there is, and it's called environmental racism. It's a systemic reality in North Carolina and across this nation. And those environmental consequences from coal ash, from industrial hog and, and poultry and, and, and dairy operations, from landfills, from polluting industrial operations, from the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and the various pipelines and compressor stations, um, all of those things that affect our health, our economic opportunity because of where we live and the spaces we live in, those are disproportionately borne by people of color in North Carolina, by Native Americans, by Latinx and African American uh, people. These same communities are the ones that are, that are already suffering from voter suppression, from over-policing, from mass incarceration and police misconduct, from the lack of access to a sound basic education. Uh, so this pandemic we've seen has just further exposed this existing marginalization of our client communities. And, you know, it, it is, um, it has also, I think what it has exposed for us and in our work right now in the regional office is the voices that have been missing from the decision making process from access to the decision makers. So one thing that we have done um, in our work is we have focused on opening up 
the opportunity for our clients to speak directly to power in this time. And I think as Serena pointed out, you know, we have a unique moment right now, um, another one. <laughs> Uh, and before it rolls away and we all forget, this is a good time to push, push our agendas, push against our common enemies, to hear it, have our voices and have our clients' voices lifted up. Um, so, so one thing we're doing in the environmental justice realm is the, the, the division, um, Department of Environmental Quality has divisions, Division of Air Quality, Division of Water Resources that issue and are oversee regulation of industry and issue permits to do that. And part of what they have to do with permitting in some instances, and even if it's not required under the Federal uh, Clean Air Act or Clean Water Act to have a public hearing or a public meeting, the division itself, uh, the Department of Environmental Quality or one of its divisions can say, we need a public hearing. And one of the things that we did um, here in the regional office and when we were at the Chamber Center and at UNC before was represent North Carolina Environmental Justice Network, a great organization to donate to, um, uh, North Carolina uh, NCEJN, uh, REACH, the Rural Empowerment Association for Community Health in Duplin County, which is the hog uh, capital of the world, and um, the Waterkeeper Alliance in a Title VI action against DEQ for the swine general permit, which has a disproportionate impact on Black, Latinx, and Native American communities. As a result of the settlement of that a couple of years ago, we got um, some pretty groundbreaking uh, um, promises from DEQ. And one of them is pub meaningful public involvement in decision making at the agency level. Um, another is an environmental justice mapping tool community mapping system is what DEQ calls it, which identifies all of the cumulative polluting sources geographically on a GIS um, map. And because we push so hard, also provides some demographic data and some health data about the, the communities that are, that are in that vicinity. We have pushed this process of engagement um, with our clients in these local areas where we see these permits coming up and pushed our clients and enabled them to have their voices heard, to insist that these permits get delayed during COVID because the public hearings are not happening, they can't happen, and that in, to insist also that a digital public hearing is not enough because, for example, in Robeson County where they're planning to um, um, put a, where active energy renewables, a, a European company is planning to put another wood pellet processing facility, which is going to poison the air and possibly the water of the majority black community um, living within that two mile radius. They have to slow down on it. DEQ needs to slow down on issuing that permit because there is a Title VI community, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, an environmental justice community that's going to hurt from that. So uh, another thing that we have done, you know, I mentioned the Title VI administrative complaint that we filed on um, behalf of EJN and REACH and Waterkeeper Alliance back in 2014 against DEQ that resulted in this settlement. We also, you know, um, so our work has focused a lot on the uh, industrial hog operations, industrial animal feeding operations, and we work with environmental groups on that. One thing that came out of um, that work is, you know, these lawsuits, these nuisance actions that were filed around the same time we filed the Title VI complaint, resulting in multi-million dollar jury verdicts against Smithfield, the, the integrator for the hog production. As a result, the legislature passed um, amendments to the Farm Act, the North Carolina Farm Act, essentially eliminating people's rights to bring nuisance challenges against uh, agricultural operations. So we filed a constitutional challenge to that, which is yet to be assigned, even though it was filed on Juneteenth of 2019, um, a, a three judge panel. Um, so we're fighting back on that too, just to have our clients claims heard. I'll stop there, but there's so much more work going on, um, so much more engagement by the Environmental Justice Network and the rest of our clients with the governor's office right now on environmental justice uh, in the age of COVID. And um, we just invite you, if you're interested in this work, to join us and join our clients on that. Thanks a lot.
Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, that again, uh, there's there is so much work to be done and so much work that's happening that, that's so exciting. So um, we've got some questions in the Q and A. We've got um, a little bit of time left, so I'm just going to uh, go through some of these quickly. Um, and and any panelists that want to answer any of these um, can do so. So the, one of the first questions. Um, was, you know, do calls or emails to representatives and petitions really make a difference? And um, I'll, I'll expand that to say, you know, what, what should people be doing um, as far as any kind of direct advocacy? We have a bunch of lawyers on the panels. We know about litigation, but, um, but what about that? What about the, the next steps for sort of direct uh, resident advocacy? I'm happy to start. Uh, and others can can jump on. I mean, it depends. I mean, one important thing, right, is uh, it is true that sort of contacting your lawmakers in many places doesn't have the same punch that it used to, in part because of uh, the impact of really corrosive gerrymandering, where um, elected officials feel very secure in, in their seats. Uh, at the same time, I think one of the things that we know is, one, obviously it's an election year, and there is a particular energy around this election year that I think, you know, obviously I'm a 501c3 organization. I can't tell, you know, we can't tell people to, you know, vote any particular way. But if you have the act of voting is itself an act of voice. Um, and so that's the first thing. Second thing is um, I would urge people to think about their localities, uh, you know, the issues that we most work most directly on in North Carolina, which are election access, there are a lot of things that can be that are controlled by local officials, people at the county level, um, you know, and they don't have the same, they're, they're not inured to public input the way that other that elected officials, members of Congress, uh, U.S. senators, folks like that are, and change often starts at home, and that's a good place to really start using uh, public impact. You know, the power of organizing is most illustrated, right, in, in what happens immediately around you. Thanks, Tomas. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to weigh in on that one. Otherwise, we'll, we'll go to another one. And if, if you do want to weigh in, just, just jump in. Um, one, one of the other questions um, somebody asked, uh, and just wanted to follow up on this, that about um, something Cami said about um, having uh, adequate data um, and whether that might be able to lead to a better allocation of police resources. Cami, can you elaborate on that just a little bit? Yes, sure. Um, I, I think we need in the criminal justice system uh, evidence-based solutions. And, uh, you know, we know that um, when we, um, that there are certain uh, policies we can put in place and they will have a, a reduction on either whether it's police violence or crime in some, in some other way. And so what I was saying uh, earlier is that there's some jurisdictions that, you know, are saying but where, where the police calls, like police aren't responding to all the calls that they receive uh, or they're not um, engaging with citizens in the way that they would normally do so that they can prevent themselves uh, um, and I, I suppose citizens as well, uh, residents as well, um, from you know, becoming infected uh, during uh, the, the pandemic. And I think it'll be really interesting to figure out where that has happened, what choices were made and what the impact of, of it was. And I suspect that what we'll find is that where some of those uh, situations where folks have you know, done I mean, a cost benefit analysis and saying, I don't want my officer to come into contact with something for something that's so petty um, that could have such a dangerous consequence. Um, and if we are keeping data on that and paying attention to that, I think it could have long-term effects. We might see that there are uh, infractions for which we should never have been involving uh, police and uh, having having them come into contact with citizens, and that our crime rates didn't explode because of it. So that's what I was saying. Yeah, and I, I think there are other data issues as well. I know we've been looking at issues related to infection rates in meatpacking plants and among workers in uh, in those um, which are deemed essential, 
And one of the challenges is how the data of who's getting sick, who's, who's testing positive is being tracked. And there's a lot of finger pointing going on between the Department of Agriculture and DHHS and county health departments. And so, um, you know, getting access to effective data, I know, is, is critical on a range of areas. Um, I, I, uh, I'm going to exert the moderator's privilege and ask one of the questions I had prepped because it's one that, that we've been getting asked about a lot, and that's um, about the economic impacts on state and local uh, revenues as a result of the crisis. And um, they are, you know, state and local uh, revenues are predicted to remain well below previous levels for the next two years. They're dropping. Um, you know, what do we expect the impact of funding loss for people of color and low wealth residents in North Carolina? And are there steps we should be taking as advocates in light of those budgetary impacts? Put another way, what's our strategy and response when elected officials claim, oh, we just don't have the money? We need to defund police. We can free up some of that budget uh, by divesting from incarceration and investing in the human services that are going to be needed to recover from this virus, this pandemic. Uh, there is no justification for spending on militarized police in a moment of public health crisis. So I think one thing that we must do is remind uh, our, our elected officials uh, that a budget is a moral document and that those choices have consequences. Other thoughts? So I will say with regards to education, there is a um, bill in the North Carolina legislature right now that would um, channel funds um, to um, lower income school districts. Um, and it recognizes that um, those school districts do not have the, um, the you know uh, rainy day funds or other access to um, additional funding that the wealthier districts have. Um, so that is certainly worth supporting and would be something that would be good to bring to the attention of your representative because that will make a big difference um, because those are the students that that absolutely cannot have have any lower level of funding than they already have now. Yeah, you know, the Lawyers Committee, we represent the interveners in the Leandro case, the Charlotte Mecklenburg NAACP, and, and we've been in negotiations with the state about implementing a remedy. And one of the things we've been pushing is that, um, you know, the, your constitutional obligations um, don't go away because there's a budget impact um, and, and those needs need to be met. So, um, so thanks for that, Ginny and Serena. Um, let's see, going back into the uh, Q&A, someone asked about whether there are bail fund um, programs or funding in the more rural counties. Um, um, do folks know whether there, those opportunities are available as well? I know some links were put in the chat um, for the, the Triangle and Durham and Fayetteville and I think Charlotte. Um, there is, um, I, I would just say, I know there is an Alamance County Bail Fund, but I also, and I put in the chat a, a link to Wake Forest students who um, are uh, working so hard with the Forsyth County Bail Fund, Commu for Forsyth County Community Bail Fund. Yeah, and I put in the chat, or in the Q&A, and I see it um, in the in the chat too, Emancipate North Carolina is doing a statewide um, bond fund, and to recommend them as well. Yeah, and I see our our old comrade Peter Gilbert has noted that Emancipate NC is running a bond fund that covers the whole state. So. Um, oh, sorry, I just said that. Mark was on. Oh, did you? <laughs> this is why it's not good to read and listen, and I need yeah. to ask. Um, a question is, was asked about the communities living in NC around the hog operations have been leaders in the environmental justice movement on issues of infectious disease like MRSA from hog farms. Are there lessons learned from those struggles for communities affected by COVID? 
Yeah, I mean, one thing that we're we're seeing, um, and this is you know, meat packing plant workers and uh, farm workers and the communities living around these, uh, you know, factory farms um, are are all again. You see their unified experience um, right now with COVID because of the infection in these congregate workspaces, right? Um, and for farm workers and the housing that they're in. Um, I mean, there's been great work done, you know, uh, on infectious diseases, diseases and, and David just hats off to Gillings School of Public Health um, and our fallen comrade, Steve Wing, and all of you who, who worked with him. Um, we need to keep that information coming and flowing. It's really important right now and persuasive with lawmakers. We're working on an emergency rule right now around um, COVID and uh, working in this industry. Um, hope that answers the question. Feels a little bit like a ramble, but. Well, the, I'm told we have time for one more question. So I'm gonna ask this, this last one because um, it's one I really would like an answer to from my, my comrades here. You know, given how all so many people are feeling at this moment, the anger, the frustration, the despair, just the pain um, that, that so many of us are experiencing, knowing that the impacts of the pandemic are continuing and by many predictions may worsen again in the coming months, especially for excluded communities, you know, how, how do we just start to re-engage again? Um, you know, how do, we, how do we find the energy to do that? And I mean, just speaking for myself, particularly when it seems like so much of the work, despite all the work we've been doing, it seems like not enough has changed. So that's another way of asking for your closing uh, thoughts. Just uh, my, my closing thought is that I think what this time highlights uh, for all of us and all of the different work that we're doing um, is that we have to continue to protect our uh, most vulnerable uh, people uh, because of times uh, like this. I think that we've got to accept that results may take a long time that we're engaged in a process that um you know may produce some short-term wins may not and um that you know i think there is you know understandably so right a big focus on dramatic events you know dramatic mobilizations like we've seen in recent weeks you know but there's so much that happens in between those dramatic mobilizations that really actually sort of set the stage for you know, how effective those end up being both short and long term. Yeah, I'm going to say something, Hope and Serena will uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll close this out. But um, what, I, I, what I've seen in the last few weeks is that what I said before, that um, I've seen people in the streets changed by their by, by others listening to them at last. I've seen our clients in rural communities that say to the state government, the state agency, you can't do this right now. And the state agency and the state government has, because that our clients said that with flanked by organizations like North Carolina Environmental Justice Network and um, Southern, Southern Environmental Law Center and Dogwood Alliance and all these white led green groups, right? But flanked with all of them and with their neighbors, the state government has said, oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll wait, we'll wait, we'll stop. And, um, and that has changed, I've seen it change our clients. Um, and we've seen, Mark and I've seen this for years, we've seen our clients change and um, when they realize their power. And so, like Tomas says, this is a long struggle, <laughs> but um, that leadership from the ground is what we need and it, the more that we can create spaces to develop that leadership, the better off our kids will be and our grandchildren.
All right. Any anything else from the panel? If I'll just say keep keep working for accountability. Um, I think that the um, you know um, the myriad videos have made a big difference um, and in telling the story. Uh, record your IP meeting. Give notice before you record it, but go ahead and record it um, because that's your record. Um, and, and that does change things. And in and, and other situations, you know, continue to hold people accountable. I think uh, I, would, I would say that I, yes, we, we are in a tremendous moment of, of exhaustion and, and fear and pain, conflict and contradiction. Um, and I don't, I don't know that I have the answer. I can tell you that what I lean into in this moment um, is a deep need to make the sacrifices so many of us are paying in this moment uh, worthwhile. Over 100,000 of our neighbors and family members have lost their lives to a disease that is preying on our weakest moral fibers. And, and we owe those memories correction. I also think about the 11,000 people who have taken a rest over the last week in this country. And I think about what it means to stay home, what it means to stay home and what do we send to those who have no home to go to. And then finally, I just think about the moment in 10 years and in 20 years when I have children and grandchildren ask me, what did you do then? What did you do then? And I wanna have a good answer. Uh, and I, I hope that we all have a better world to welcome our children and grandchildren into in the days to come. Thank you all. That was a perfect note to go out on. Thank you all for coming. Thanks again to all the panelists for being part of this. Um, uh, there are links in the chat to lots of the references you heard. There'll be a recording made available. You could email me or Elizabeth through the Lawyers Committee. You can find all the panelists through the Google and uh, we will continue this struggle together. Goodbye. <laughs>